Howdy everybody, David Minkin here, starting player with Connect More, and welcome to another edition of Avoid the Rules, a video of instruction and demonstration that helps ease rule understanding and learning. Easy start. And today we are going to jump into the wild and wacky world of Ivor the Engine. Now, if you are a middle-aged, slightly balding UK individual who used to watch Ivor the Engine as a kid growing up, well then stop watching this video and just go play the game. Because A, you obviously like playing real board games because you're watching a video on board games. And B, this does a great job of reliving some of Ivor's tales. There's actually original artwork and new artwork in, um, throughout the game for you to kind of get re-immersed and go down memory lane and think about Ivor the Engine. So that's all you need to know you're good to play. What, what about the rest of us? What about those of us who did not grow up in the UK, who don't know anything about the uh, about Ivor the Engine, he only popped up on my radar. Why? Because there happens to be a great board game designer out there who's also middle-aged, slightly balding from the UK, who watched us as a kid growing up, who designed another train game which I absolutely love, Snowdonia, and that designer is Tony Boydell. So because of this game, this game came on my radar. So I said, right, I know nothing about Ivor, but is this going to be a great game? And the answer is absolutely, it is a good game. Because if you think about it, is there a better person to design this game than Tony Boydell? He was a fan of the show to begin with. Apparently, I think he played this game or had a version of this game even before it came to publication. He played at home, so he's obviously a huge fan. If you read his blog, he loves train spotting and anything trains at all. He's totally into. His games that he designs are fairly solid. His train games here at Snowdonia is fantastic. So if you want, to jump back into a world that you remember as a kid with a real game, who else could do it other than Tony Boydell? The answer, I can't think of it. So with that going ahead, we steam forward and say, right, I am excited to play this game. But let's just curb our enthusiasm just a little bit. And the reason why is because there's a few people in my game group, myself included, that we're hoping that this game was going to be my our kids' first train game. The age of kids within my game group ranges anywhere from about 2 through 11, you know, teenage years. And some of us, when we see this box, it says contains sheep, it's got awesome artwork, it's cute, it's whimsical, it's about trains, it's got little sheeples in here. And you say, right, I'm going to get my kids playing this game, I'm going to introduce them to the wild and wonderful world of Tony Boydell train games, and then by Christmas we'll be playing Snowdonia and my master plan will have come to fruition. Ha 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 ha. No, you can't do that because this game is very much a, uh, a game for people who respect and enjoy a great game. Uh, the theme is, is great, it's awesome, don't get me wrong, but underneath this there's a lot going on in the game and uh, it's not going to be suitable uh, for your young kids. For my kids it definitely is not suitable because there's a lot of this. There's a lot of like sucker punching that, go, that goes on in this game and it's just a lot of screwage that goes on. And I'm trying to think of a good way to how to describe this because it's not it's not cutthroat. I wouldn't use that word to describe it. That's a little um, too vicious. But it's kind of like when you're a kid. And I see my two boys do this. I got a three year old and four year old boy, and like they'll go up to each other, like you know, twist each other's nipples or give them a sucker punch, and then the other kid's like. Aah! going nuts and the other kid and the one who did it the instigator just takes off and the instigator thinks it's hilarious he's having a great time and then the other the guy who just got picked on he comes back and then he'll go plant him down and like you know uh uh you know pass wind on his face you know hold him down and you know give him another sucker punch and then now you got the other kid crying and he runs away and he thinks it's hilarious now that's this type of game because there's a lot of just sucker punching going on and as a gamer you have to decide with if you find it more enjoyable to pick on people than, than it is to get picked on, well then this will be the game for you. If you get offended by that type of thing, there's a lot of this take that interaction that goes on, which I think is awesome, it's, it's absolutely great. Um, it's not going to be the game for you if that's the way it, that way it goes. And so here's the thing: is lots of times a board game geek, or you see people quoting uh, Will Wheaton. They say he's got this quote: "It's like don't be a dick," or above all, don't be a dick. And during this game, when we were playing it, we we're referring to it as you know, there's a certain level of dickiness you need to have in this game. And 
And if the designer has made a game for you to do that or to be a dick in the game, if you want to use Will Wheaton's uh, phrases or, or to, to, um, to, you know, kind of sucker punch each other, then you must do it. The designer obviously knows that's part of the game, so then you need to do that in order to have a, uh, to do well in the game. Like, so if you have a problem with that, then don't play this game. And that's the reason why, especially for kids, it might not be a suitable game because it's it's a really cheeky kind of behavior that goes on. And some of the people after they said the game, that like, I'm not really sure that uh, you know my kid is quite ready for this type of interaction. They might it might hurt their feelings, even though it's still in the game. They're just not old enough to handle that. The reason why I say that is because. The measure of disappointment is the difference between your expectation and reality if reality is uh, below your expectation. And if you come into this game expecting a game that's going to be suitable for your kid, and that's going to be up for you to decide, you know the temperament of your kid better than, than anybody else, is then um, you might be disappointed with this game because you have a, an expectation that's not reasonable for this game. But if you come into this game expecting to have great player interaction, and playing a real game, this game is going to involve you know some hand management, and uh, it is it really forces you to do some hand management because if you exceed your hand limit, you not only lose cards but you actually lose sheep, which are counted towards a victory condition. So you you're really working your cards all the time. It's got some great player interaction, and one of the primary mechanics is also pick up and deliver because you're picking up these sheep and you're um, you're taking them into your pasture, but it's not really a deliver. You got to go places to pick the sheet up, but you don't really have to deliver them anywhere. You as soon as you pick them up, they come off the board into your your area. So there are some uh, some great mechanics here that work very well together. And uh, I hope you stick stay tuned. I'm going to teach you how to play this game. I got it laid out here in front of you. I'd love to share it with you. So without further ado, let's get started. And if you like this video, please come back and see me on my Facebook page, Connect More Board Games, or give me a, a follow on YouTube. Whatever you'd like, it'd be great to do more videos for you in the future. And stay tuned. Welcome to the world of Ivor the Engine. Now before I get into the nitty gritty and the game explanation, I just want to do a quick focus here on the board itself. And I want to do that for two reasons. The first is I think that the board is gorgeous. I think it's got really nice artwork with it and it fits the theme really well. It kind of makes me wish that I grew up watching Ivor the Engine as a kid because I think I could really get immersed into this little, into this board. And if we just kind of zoom in a little bit and look at some of the details on the board, you know, for example, we go over there we see there's a it looks like a fox hunt going on next to the railroad line and then we zoom a little bit further I think we're gonna find Ivor the engine here yeah there's Ivor just chuffing away now this is kind of funny because when I see Ivor just chuffing away there you see that he's actually on a track going off the board and if you follow the track kind of where he came from it looks like he actually came from Ivor's shed which is over there and you guys sitting there like hey Ivor we just made a game about you and it looks like you're just chuffing away hey well come back buddy this game's all about you. Well, I think I've got a few explanations as to why he's chuffing away, and I'll get to that in a second. So I just kind of want to showcase the board. I find myself just sitting and studying the board and looking at all the neat little artwork. It's, uh, uh, it's quite captivating. So that's the first thing that I want to show, because there's going to be a lot of pieces that I'm going to put onto this board very quickly, and you're going to lose a lot of this uh, detail right away. The second reason why I want to showcase this board is some people have complained that it's difficult for them to analyze the board and what they may or may not be able to do during gameplay and so they've gotten a little bit frustrated because they haven't been able to kind of figure out some of the paths that connect or don't connect in the game. As mentioned at the beginning of this video, the primary mechanic used in Ivory the Engine is the pick up and deliver mechanic. Now like any pick up and deliver game, one should have a thorough and comprehensive understanding of all the different routes that are available to them on the board so that you might be able to use them effectively and efficiently so that hopefully you might emerge the victor of the game. Woohoo! So I want to show this board without anything on top of it so you can understand how the routes work in this game. So as you might imagine, Ivor the Engine, we are going to travel along throughout this board via these train tracks that are on here. But superimposed on top of this board, you'll see that there are a bunch of hexes that are on this board. And the color of each of the side of the hexes can either be black or it can be white or, or light. And this is very simply showing you which parts of the hex you can actually travel through. So if you are traveling along any one of these 
railroad tracks and you're going from one hex space into another hex space, if you go through a white colored border, well then that is legit. You can do that. You can travel through any white colored border. So this hex space and this hex space are adjacent to each other via this train track. Whereas you see there's other hex spaces here which are black in color. You by no means can ever travel through those spaces. But it's really quite self-explanatory honestly because if you just follow where the tracks go, well then if the track goes from one hex to the next, well then it's going to go through a white space. So that's just a reminder to you that you can't start suddenly driving, start driving on these roads. No, you have to actually stay on the train track. You are actually driving a train. So there you have it. It's pretty self-explanatory, but it's important to point that out because the exception to that rule is that you have a town up here and you have a town down here. So this is Langubin or Antiwin. I'm not really sure how you pronounce that, but we'll go with that for now. And these two cities can actually be connected. You can travel from one to the next by essentially paying the double cost that you would normally pay. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. But you'll notice that if you follow and trace your finger from one town to the next, you're actually on a double train track and it goes all the way through from one to the next. And so that's a special exception that you'd pay extra to be able to travel from here to here or conversely from there to there. So that's where you you need to take in mind because you see it's actually breaking through some of these black lines. That's the exception to the rule. So there you have it. I want to point that out because some people have complained that they don't see that when they're playing the game once we put all the sheep and everything else on here. I say that's hogwash because any game worth playing you're going to play a couple times and you're going to get the feeling for it. Whether it be cards with different symbols on it, whether it be different um, rules that are trickier to figure out it's going to take you a couple plays to do, or whether it be a map that you just need to get a little bit more familiar with. It just doesn't matter. So just adapt. You're game players. You're watching a game playing video it's not a big deal but for some people I guess it was so I just wanted to point that out okay let me get off my soapbox rant is over back to the game so as I mentioned before here you see little Ivor and he's just chuffing the way out of town he's like I'm getting out of here and he has good reason to get out of here because you and your fellow game players are about to put him to work because the way you're going to win this game is you're going to be the person who at the end of the game has the most sheep in your pasture. Now you're going to have this little card and it works really well because your first couple games there's a little turn summary that's here at the bottom and you're going to be collecting sheep along the way. You're going to be putting them here in your pasture and as you get more experience you can just flip this card over. It's a bigger pasture but the summary is now gone. So whatever your preference is you can choose a side. So we are going to be trying to collect these sheep throughout the course of the game. Now how are we going to do that? Well there's a variety of ways we can do that. We can actually do that through our movement of our actual um, player piece which is here which is one of Ivor's little you know cars that we're going to use so this is the piece that we're actually going to be using to kind of slide um, around on the tracks to go pick up sheep and we're going to be doing that throughout the course of the game I'll show you how plus we got a whole deck of cards here which is a whole variety of different different jobs that Ivor is going to be put to and by accomplishing these job cards we can actually earn sheep along the way and so there's a little reward for sheep but the nice thing about these cards is that they actually have dual purpose so you can actually accomplish a job which would be in this particular location on the board and if you do that you'd get three sheep or conversely you can use this card for its special effect right here so I'll describe this in just a little bit so you'll notice these little playing pieces that I just pointed out to you that we're going to move little Ivers cars around on the track on the main board. And I just want to point this out because this is another little reason why if you think that this is going to be a game for your kids, this is reason why it really isn't. I'm going to tell you why. Because I showed this game to my kids and I pulled it up and I said, hey, we're going to play a train game. Let's play it. And I showed them this um, playing piece and they go, well, dad. Where is my train? I'm like, well, no, you're going to be one of Ivor's cars. This is Ivor the engine, and there's only one engine. It's only possible to have one engine, so we all got to be his cars because we're going to be, you know, doing his work for him. He's going to be call hauling these cars around, and immediately they lost interest because thematically this is correct. I get it. I fully understand it. But for kids, they want to be pushing trains around, and this isn't a train. So that's another reason I just want to point them out as we go along why this is probably not the best fit for your kid's first train game. So let's set up the board and let's go through this in more detail. So here we have the game partially set up. And I just want to show you the partial setup and then we'll show you the final setup here in a second. So what you'll see here on the actual board is I've taken and there's all these little tokens of sheep on there and you put them all so that the image of the sheep is actually face up in each of the hexagons on the board. And so once you've laid all these out, it's completely random, then you flip them over and you'll notice that there's actual number on the other side. And this indicates the number of sheep that you're actually going to put onto that space 
at the beginning of the game. So we flip all of these over like so. Then what we're going to do is then we're just going to take the sheep tokens or the sheep meeples that are available to us and we are just going to put that same number of sheep inside of that hexagon. So stay with me and I'll put the sheep on. All right, now we got all of the sheep on. Now you see why I actually showed you the board before the game started, before we put all those bits on, because it's getting a little bit more difficult to see the actual art and the uh, tracks underneath all of these sheep on here. But now what we're going to do is we're going to look along all of these tokens with the number on them, and any of the tokens that have a zero or a one on them, we actually will now remove from the game. So we take these actually off, and it's actually really quite clever. I really like this part of the game. I'm going to describe why why we do this during the gameplay, but I'll get back to this, so stay tuned. So once we do that, we double check, make sure there's no zeros or ones left over. It doesn't appear as though there are. Now we take these numbered tokens again and we flip them back over back to the sheep side. So let's do that. So now we have all of the lost sheep tokens, which again are these tokens right here, flip back over. And the reason why they're still on the board will become very apparent when I describe to you the turn sequence. We'll get to that. Now the last few things I want to point out to you is we actually have a coal pool right here. We have a gold pool right over here. And here, just for example purposes, I've set up what might be one person's play area. We've assigned this person the starting player token, which is here is the little Ivor the Engine uh, token right here with his uh, little driver there. So we, that's your starting player token. The starting player does not actually move throughout the course of the game. So you give this in the rule book, it says you give it to the youngest player, and this will actually stay with that person. So as you might guess, this means that everybody in this game must have equal number of turns. So if somebody achieves the game ending condition, which is actually player number dependent, so if you are playing with three to four players, the first player to collect 24, 25 sheep in their pen over in here will trigger the end game. But then you keep playing the rest of the round until everyone has an equal number of turns. So uh, keep that in mind. I think this came from here. So he's got his pen and each player also starts with one coal and one gold. Now over here, much like you'd imagine in Ticket to Ride, you have your deck of cards, these are your job cards, with uh, four face-up cards here for you to choose from. So when it's your turn to actually draw a card, you actually choose from these different job cards that are available to you. Now what we've also done is we, from this deck of job cards, we've dealt every player three cards as well as their starting hand. And so here you start with some job cards, which I'll explain. And now that we've done that, what we're going to do is we're going to take what are referred to as these event cards. And there's 11 of them. We're going to take three. We're going to shuffle them up, of course. And we're going to shuffle them up like this. Whatever. It doesn't really matter. We take three of them. We, we toss them in the box like so. And then we take the remaining job card deck here. And we shuffle in the remaining eight event cards. So I'll do that now. Okay, so we're ready to play. So now what you do is you just simply take your player color and we'll assume here with the starting player he would be a black uh, little Ivor car right here and you get to start choose your starting position anywhere you possibly want. So here we're going to put this guy here at Grumbly Gasworks and let's assume we're playing with uh, two other players, orange and red, so you might choose to put one over here and somebody else might choose to go over here for example. So you're ready to start the game. So without further ado, let's play the game. So it's going to be Black's turn because he is the starting player and I always like to use these player aids that games give you so you can follow along so you know what to look at when you're actually playing the game at your own home. So the very first thing that you're going to do is you're going to take a sheep. So the black guy, he takes the sheep right here and goes, woohoo, I put that in my pen, I'm well on my way to victory. Now you'll notice that since this hex only started with one sheep, it does not actually have one of these lost sheep tokens in it. You'll recall that I actually removed those during the setup part of the game. And that's actually quite significant because when you take the last sheep from a hexagon, should there be a lost sheep token inside that hexagon, you also get to take that lost sheep token, add it to your playing area, and in addition, from the pool, you'll get two additional sheep that you'll get to add to your playing area as well. But since we there was no lost sheep token in this area, then we don't actually get that benefit. And that's really cool because what that does, it stops you from cherry picking the easy spots at the beginning of the game. Because since there were, I believe it was three spots that are either zero or one sheep in it, then you would see the obvious strategy then would be to immediately put your car where there's only one sheep and uh, and then get the bonus immediately, the extra two sheep immediately for that, uh, for emptying the last sheep from that hexagon. But since 
there is no lost sheep token there. We took that off during the setup. There is no bonus to be had. So that was, uh, I really like how they've done that. So you can't cherry pick these spots. So the lost sheep tokens are only in hexagons that have two or more sheep at the beginning of the game. So why did the black guy actually choose there? Well, we go on to the next phase, which is actually move and play cards. Now you can play cards before you move. You can move, play cards, and move again. Uh, it can be in any sequence that you want as long as it obeys the rules. So what are the rules? Well, if you're going to play a job card, and again, recall that the job card, if you're going to complete the job, you must be in the town or the village indicated at the top of the job card. And that village or town must have zero sheep in it. There must not be any more sheep left in that village or town for you to be able to complete the job. But here we see, we're looking at the black person's uh, cards right now, or the black player's cards, and you see that he actually has a job card in Grumbly Gasworks. Well, this is why he actually chose this location. You see here he's actually in Grumbly Gasworks, and by clearing out that last sheep at the beginning of his turn, there are no sheep left on this hexagon. So he is entitled to actually accomplish this job. So you can see now his strategy for choosing this as a starting location. So he says, right, I'm going to play this card. I'm going to accomplish this job at Grumbly Gasworks. I'm going to take a flat truck of potatoes to Grumbly Gasworks and for my efforts, I'm going to get four sheep. So you take this and you, you put it in the discard pile and for his efforts from the pool, you get four sheep. And he's going to add that to his pen. Now, here's, I just want to take a, brief second to show you a little bit more about the components. You'll see now that the black player actually has five sheep inside of his pen. Now, inside the game we have these little black squares, these thin little black squares that are referred to as a sheep flock. And this represents five sheep. And some people complained about this, but honestly, I think this is awesome. And the reason why is you'll recall that the game ending condition for this game is again, you have to either get 20 or 25 sheep in your pen. And so when you're playing with a bunch of players, and if they have a whole stack of sheep like this in your pen, you're like, what the heck? I have no idea. I can't count how many sheep that this person actually has because they're all stacked. They're all willy nilly and you're trying to figure it out. Is that person close? I'm not really sure. It's just a pain. And so I really, really like these. In fact, when we play, we insist that once you get five sheep in your pen, that you immediately trade it in for one of these so that when you're playing with everybody else, you can just see, just like when you're playing poker, if you see someone's poker hand across the table and they got their stack of chips up like this, you can just immediately look right away and go, right, that guy's got 20 sheep and you know that when you don't have to spend a lot of time analyzing it and it doesn't drag the game down at all. So whether this was by, by design or whether this was just to cut costs, I don't know. And frankly speaking, I don't care because I think it's brilliant. I think it is absolutely brilliant to have these because it is a lot of counting involved with the game end. And when you see a big stack of all these sheep, it's hard to count from across the way. So now that he's actually got five sheep in his pen, if you're playing with me, then I would say, you know what? Trade those in. So you take these in and you trade them in for a flock and you get one of your, your little flat squares here and you add it to your sheep. And so then right away, everyone can see that you have five. That's just the way that we play. You can choose what works for you, but I find that just makes the game a lot easier, especially as a lot people get more and more sheep throughout the game. It's much, much easier to count across the way. People are complaining they want big sheep. They want these big sheep and what the heck, let's draw some smiley faces on them and make them all happy. Big monster sheep walking around in Ivor's world. Sure, why, why not? These are actually from Animal Upon Animal animal. Uh, use what you want. You can substitute these in. To me, it's not a, a big, uh, it's not a big deal. I like these. I like it's easier to count. Um, but if you want, you can find substitutes that will work just as fine. So that's just a brief comment about components. For me, I don't comment and I don't really dwell on components too much unless I find it helps or hinders the gameplay. And I actually find that this actually helps the gameplay by having these set up as these uh, these little um, rectangular squares are easier to count. So uh, great job. So anyhow, we've uh, accomplished our job here at Grumbly Gasworks and we can choose to move and we can get one free movement to any adjacent space. So again, we can move along the track to an adjacent space through one of these white space, one of these white lines on the hexagon. We move 
move over there. Should we decide we want to keep trucking along, well then any additional movement from that free movement, one movement is free, would cost us one coal per space. So if we wanted to, we could spend another coal and keep chuffing along. And you can also, at any time during the game, you can take one of your gold pieces and you can trade that in for two coal. So again, these coal can be used for, uh, again, to keep trucking along. So we're just going to go here. The black guy says, you know what, I'm happy with this move. I'm going to stay put. So stay put, he does. So we move on to the next step. And the next step is we can actually take a card. So what you're going to do now is um, we take a look at the four cards that are face up and you take a look and try to figure out well what card do I want to to look and you see well there's a uh, card here a job card that's actually in the town the the village that I currently am in this Tawny Gwilch or whatever but that might not be of any benefit to me because there's still two sheep on here. I'm not really sure if I'll be able to accomplish this, but oh, what the heck, I'm going to take this, I'm going to add it into my hand. So then again, you add it to your hand, he's back up to three cards. Now your hand limit throughout the course of the game is four. Should you get a fifth card into your hand during this phase, you must discard one of those cards to get back down to four. But here is the gotcha. You're not only discarding a card when you do that, you also must get rid of one of the sheep from your pen. You gotta throw one of the things that actually counts towards the victory game ending condition away. So in that regard, this game is really great because it encourages you, and in fact I would say it forces you to play play these cards. And what's great about that is again keeping in mind that you can only accomplish these jobs if there are no sheep present in either that town or that village. Well take a look at the board. There is a whole boatload of sheep on here at the beginning of the game. So you're going to be forced to play a lot of these special benefits on the card that labeled on the bottom. And a lot of these special benefits in fact are forcing you to kind of tweak and kind of give little little knuckle dusters and, and punch the other guys a little bit and kind of you know beat them down a little bit because you have to get rid of the cards because if you don't you're going to start losing sheep so you got to start picking on each other and it's going to occur immediately because you need to start clearing the sheep so it's uh, just a really great mechanic I love how the cards work that way and how at the beginning of the game there's going to be a lot of interaction you come out of the gate swinging at each other so that is just is brilliant. So what you do is you take your card and then you need to um, replenish the deck and woohoo what we have here is what's an event card. Now recall that I shuffled these into the, the um, deck earlier and so when you reveal an event card the event takes place immediately. So here we read the, the course of the event it goes when this card is revealed Every player may take one sheep from their current location and put it into their sheep pen. Woohoo! Good news! Uh, it sounds like we're all getting some sheep here. If you take the last sheep, you get to take the lost sheep token again, um, as usual, and you get the bonus. So, what we all do is so the black player will take his sheep. So now he's sitting like, hey, wait a second, this is pretty good because recall, I actually have this card here. So on my next turn, I might be able to take that last sheep and I'll be able to accomplish this job card as well. That worked out favorably. The red card, he'll take his sheep and he'll just put it in his pen, which is off the screen. And the orange guy, he'll take his sheep and he'll put it in his pen that's off the screen. So that worked out really well. So is there anything else here? Well, the event card, so you have what's referred to as the event and we resolve that immediately, which we just did. Now, at the bottom, all of the event cards have these game ending scoring conditions on them. They, they differ and they're explained quite well in the rule book. And this particular event says you get one additional sheep for each of these lost sheep tokens that you actually have in your play area. So recall again, these lost sheep tokens are what are placed here. And if you take the last sheep from an area that has this lost sheep token, you actually take this lost sheep token and you add it to your play area. So this is a, a special benefit where you might want to try to be Johnny on the spot throughout the game and start collecting as many of these lost sheep tokens as you can because you would get actually uh, one additional sheep for doing so. So this is an added bonus that actually doesn't count towards the game ending condition but it's going to help you immensely in the victory condition. So that's that's really cool. Now the other thing that you'll see here is actually to get an event card, to pull an event card off the string of deck, the string of cards, it's actually going to cost you one gold to do so. Event cards are not um, free whereas the job cards are. But when you do put an event card out, you also add a sheep on top of the card. So 
uh, so it, it pays itself off. So if you take an event card, you pay a gold, but you also get immediately a sheep to add to your pasture. And at the end of the game, any gold that you have left, you, you trade one gold for one sheep. So it, uh, it kind of pays itself off a little bit, but you would use gold to actually buy the event card. The other thing, as I mentioned before, you use gold to actually um, trade for two coal. So that's the other thing gold is useful for. And there are other event cards that actually have um, special bonuses for gold that you have at the end of the game. So so anyhow, so we resolve the event card, we put the sheep on top, and now we're ready to move over to Red's turn. So let me just play through Red's and Orange's turn very quickly and hopefully show you a few other little um, things in the game. So it's Red's turn, so again, uh, he's going to take the first sheep, uh, take a sheep from the current position, and he is going to put it off to the side. So now it's Red's turn to actually move and or play cards. And so he's looking at his current position, he's like, you know, I like being in Smoke Hill right now, because on my next turn I'll be able to not only get this last sheep, hopefully, Hopefully if everything goes well, I'll also be able to get this lost sheep token and maybe I might want to try to get this event card later. So maybe that's something I want to go for. But let me take a look at my cards. And he looks at his cards, it's still too early in the game to try to achieve any of the jobs at any of these um, three locations. But he takes a look at this particular ability of this card and he's like, well wait a second, look at this one. It goes, take one sheep from three different locations and put them back in the stock. He's like, well that doesn't really immediately benefit me. Well what else there might be? Put any lost sheep tokens on locations that now have no sheep back in the box. He's like, well, so I'm going to just start clearing stuff off the board and putting it back in the box. I'm not sure that helps me. But he's like, oh, wait a second, look at the, the black token over here. He's just sitting over here waiting to get this last uh, lost sheep token bonus. So he's like, you know what? I'm going to, to give this guy a little jab. I'm going to get after this black guy. I'm playing this card for this effect. So he plays this card, puts it in a discard pile, and he goes, right, I'm going to take this sheep, and what other sheep should I take? I'm going to take some sheep that are close by so I can pick them up later. I'll take this sheep and uh, why not? I will just take one over here. I'll take this sheep. So he takes those three sheep tokens and he puts them back in the box. But on this particular spot you see now there's this lost sheep token. Now normally the black guy was sitting there waiting to get this so he could get that two sheep bonus. Well too bad for you because now this lost sheep token according to the card, I'll just get it in focus right there, uh, this lost sheep token according to the card is back in the box nobody gets that bonus no soup for you or I guess in this game no sheep for you so the red's feeling pretty smug about himself and he's kind of setting himself up to be able to start you know maybe picking up a few uh, job cards along the way here or or perhaps um, getting some of these lost sheep tokens so he's feeling pretty good about that and uh, he's going to stop there so the red stops there says right I'm happy with that so now the red player himself he gets to choose a card and he's taking a look at it and since he's setting himself up here for some of these lost sheep tokens Tokens, he's like, right, I would like to get this event card and try to get after this end of game scoring condition here. So what Red is going to do is he'll actually pay the gold and this gold actually came from his playing area because he had one to start the game. He puts it back into the uh, the pool here and he takes this event card and he adds it over into his play area. In addition, he gets to take the sheep that was on the event card and he adds it to his pasture, which is just off the screen. So that's the Red's turn. So you see that he did not actually move, but he's setting himself up to kind of go either way. And then we refill the card over here and we got another card in play. So now we go to the orange player's turn and now we're getting the hang of how this whole thing works. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to take a sheep from your current location and the orange player will add it to his sheep pen, which again is just off the screen here. Now it's orange's turn to actually move and or play cards. And so now again orange is in a similar situation as red. He's like I kind of like being over here in Ivor's shed here because I'm sitting on this last sheep here and I'm taking a look over here here at these cards that are available for me to pick up and I see that there's one here in Ivor's shed. So maybe if I can stick around here for one more turn and pick up this card at the end of my turn, I might be able to get a few sheep bonus here from the lost sheep token plus play a card there on my next turn. I'm going to just probably hang out here. So Orange is quite happy with that and he decides to look at his cards and he doesn't really see anything that he really likes right now and there's a few little things out here that will allow him to pick on other players right away. Here for example he could choose another player and that player must put two sheep uh, from, from the sheep pen back into the stock so he could start kind of start poking and prying at people and he looks over at black and black's already got lots of sheep he's like well maybe that would be a good choice to do but he's sitting here he's like you know what? I don't really want to annoy anybody quite yet because I'm kind of sitting on a little bit of a strategy here myself so maybe I'm just going to lay low this turn and that's a perfectly reasonable strategy as well so then he decides you know what I am just going to stay put I'm not going to do anything there because 
he sees now that to, for him to get a card, he's going to pick up the Ivor's Shed card, which is where he is right now, and he's hoping that he'll get a chance to play that in his next turn. And he better play a card next turn, because you see by picking up this card, he's now got four cards in his hand. So he's actually at his hand limit. No problem now, but on his next turn, if he doesn't actually play one of these cards, um, he is going to be obliged to throw a card away, plus lose a sheep from his pen. So you can see immediately, this game is going to force interaction. If you're trying to build up and sit low, lay low, and wait for a strategy to unfold, well, too bad. This game is going to say, no, time for you to deliver a sucker punch to somebody because the game demands it. And that is just awesome. There's no kind of sitting around laying low. Now, while I'm showing you these cards, the other thing that I find really cool about these cards is you can see that some of the original artwork, and you see this here in Ivor's Shed, has been preserved and is actually on the cards. And I think that is just awesome. I'm really glad to see that they've done that. There's also um, new artwork that's been done specifically for the game. And you can actually, when you closely examine the cards, you can actually pick that out, what's new and what's old, and sometimes you're a little bit confused. But I can see how this game, if you're playing this, and especially if you watch this as a kid growing up, I can really see how when you look at this, you can really get lost into the world of Ivor. You can really take a look at these cards. For us, we kind of found we're more looking at the cards and we're kind of, you know, examining them, kind of asking questions. Like, for example, you look at this one, and you're like, oh, well, look at that you know um uh, why is Ivor steaming but not the teapot are they having cold tea you know so so we were kind of more looking at it from that perspective here they're kind of having their tea there and why is this guy's head so crooked is he confused and so so it was kind of fun you know for us to kind of go through these things and, and especially this uh this little dragon guy here Idris uh, we're not really sure what to make of this guy apparently he sings in the choir but uh it was quite a lot of fun to actually look through these cards and see what's going on and, see, and try to imagine what the world of Ivor was like like. So enough about that. So the uh, orange player is taking these four cards, put them in his hand, and then he is going to reveal the next card. So here again we reveal the next card and we go back to the black player's turn. So around and around we go until finally somebody reaches the game ending condition. We finish that round and then we score any bonuses that people may have had on their event cards. We also exchange our gold, one gold per sheep, and then the person finally at the end of that who has the most sheep is the winner. Now I should also mention just a few final bookkeeping details. Should you ever have three event cards in the uh, the face-up cards here, you clear all of the face-up cards and you reset that. Again, that would be very much like Ticket to Ride. In Ticket to Ride, whenever you have three of those wild or engine cards um, in the face-up stack, you clear them and then you replace them. So you apply the same methodology here. There are also a couple tokens included in the game which I have not mentioned. Here we have this uh, Sleeping Idris or Sleeping Idris uh, Dragon uh, token which tells you to miss one turn. And we also have what are referred to as these kind of these uh, runaway uh, sheep tokens. Now these tokens come out when special cards are played. And I'll show you what those cards look like. So there are two cards in the job deck which show the Sleeping Idris token on them. So should you play one of these job cards for its special ability at the bottom here, you would actually then take this token, you add it to your playing area, and it just reminds you that on your next turn you're actually going to miss your turn. And the reason being is that the special ability here at the bottom of the card is actually quite powerful, and it's so powerful in fact to kind of, you know, balance the game out a little bit more, is that you'll actually miss your next turn. So you'd actually take the token to remind yourself that around the next turn you don't take it. But you see, these are pretty big cards altogether because even the jobs themselves, should you be able to accomplish them, are worth quite a few sheep. They're worth six sheep each. So there's always this nice interesting dynamic between trying to go for the job and choosing different events that try to help you advance further. And the really cool thing about the game setup and the random uh, setup that happens is in some games, you might get this particular job card late in the game, it's empty, you're nearby, and then it's a really good way to score some, some sheep. But Conversely, you might also get this very early in the game, and there's still a lot of sheep maybe piled up on here, and you can't really be holding on to cards too much, or then you might get penalized, you might be going over your hand limit. So then you might be going for something like this instead, more chasing the event. So it's uh, it's really quite interesting how, as you play the game more and more, how the different cards will actually be 
used differently at different times in the game. And we also have two job cards that have this little runaway sheep token on them. And just like the sleeping uh, Idris card is uh, here, what this does uh, when you play it for the card for its special ability at the bottom here, it says give a runaway sheep token to another player. So you'd actually take one of these tokens and you give it to a player of your choice. Until the end of their next turn, that player must put any sheep they receive back into the stock instead of into their sheep pen. Brutal! So again, here's just another, uh, hey, I'm going to sucker punch you again, and here's a little token for you to look at to remind you of how annoying I'm being to you. So it's just fantastic. So there's two cards that are like that, and uh, these are the runaway tokens just to remind the other person that you screwed them. So stay with me for a few final thoughts. I try to incorporate most of my commentary throughout the video so the final thoughts won't be very long, but I still think it's important just to summarize and discuss a few final details to help you decide whether or not this game may or may not be a good fit for you and your family or your game group. So that's it. Welcome back. I don't have much to say for my final thoughts because I covered most of it at the beginning of the video because I wanted to set our expectations before we got nitty gritty and rolled our sleeves up and really got after it. And um, I was trying to pepper in a lot of my thoughts throughout the video itself. So hopefully by now you have a great understanding as to uh, what this game is for you. So I just want to say I like this game. Um, it's a good one. It's a keeper. Um, the only thing I can say about this game is it might be a challenge to find exactly when you're going to get to play this and I'll tell you why. It's because hopefully by now you've realized that there's a lot of interaction and it's a pretty cut, not, not cutthroat, but it's a pretty direct and pretty some people might take it as a personal interaction because you're forced to cut target players and you're forced to go after them and everybody's got to do it in the game and not everybody likes that style of play. So the other thing about this is since this plays three to five players, if you have four players and you say, right, let's play Ivor, you all got to be on board for that style of play. I'm always game for that. I know a few other people are always game for that. But I also know a lot of people, if they can, they avoid that kind of game. They just don't want to bring that onto the game table. They, they play games to escape from, be, like they want to be in a comfortable environment the whole time. And even though you say, well, it's just a game, it's still, it's not the style of game that they like to play. So I find when you're, when you have a full complement to actually play this game, it's difficult to get it, you know, pull it off the shelf amongst all your other decisions because you might have some people who just aren't into that. But if you are into that, above all else, I find the thing that makes this game awesome is the sucker punching that goes on. And if you've got a group that enjoys that, fantastic, you will enjoy this game. Other than that, I don't really have much else to say. Please you leave your comments below if you have any uh, opinions that agree or disagree. I'd love to hear them. And if you enjoyed this video, please come find me on Facebook or on YouTube. Connect more board games. I'd love to see you there. And until the next time, enjoy playing your games. Cheers.